call to worship is from Psalm 9, verses 1 and 2. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonders. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Our opening hymn is, will be introduced by Mr. Joseph Wright. <coughs> First hymn this morning, number 14, Stand Up and Bless the Lord, number 14, and of course, we'll stand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Well, in the King James Version is, Thou shalt not kill. Uh, more recent versions have, have it in the form of, Thou shalt not commit murder. It's not wrong to kill, necessarily. There are just occasions, as we will consider later on, when killing must take place. But here the command is against murdering, taking away innocent life. But more positively, the commandment is having to do with those careful studies, lawful endeavors to preserve the life of ourselves and others. It suggests to us that we should be active and engaged in trying to uh, bring God's world under control in such a way that we enhance life. So the pursuit of a variety of studies, whether it be in, in, in the field of medicine, producing uh, uh, drugs and medications that will help people relieve them of their ailments, whether it be in a variety of hospital settings with therapies that are provided for folks, or the kinds of things that go on in everyday life, building roads and, and providing safety requirements on uh, workplaces and on uh, communities and so forth. These are positive, lawful endeavors to preserve our own life and others, the lives of others. Uh, notice the catechism stresses lawful endeavors to preserve these things. There are times when uh, we cannot preserve the life of others, in other words, or ourselves. For example, if you are being uh, asked to deny your faith in Jesus Christ at the threat of death, do you then defend yourself by denying Christ? Well, certainly you should not. You must remain faithful and true to the Lord, even if that means that you will lose your life in confessing your faith in Christ. So, lawful endeavors to preserve our own life or the lives of others are appropriate. We should resist all thoughts and purposes, subduing all passions, and avoiding all occasions. The Catechism focuses on the internal kinds of things that develop within us. If we harbor anger or hatred within our hearts, as Jesus told us, we are breaking the command not to commit murder. And so we need to subdue those kinds of passions that rise up within us. Resist the kinds of thoughts and thinking that plans evil or harm to others. Uh, don't give way to those kinds of things. And avoid all occasions, the kinds of things that might tempt you or encourage you to become angry, frustrated, or upset with things. Avoid even those. Be careful to protect yourself against those kinds of practices. Anything which tends to the unjust taking away of life. The catechism, and with this we'll close at this point, does uh, speak of the just defense thereof against violence uh, and, and patient bearing of the hand of God. There is a place for defending yourself. There is a right and an obligation to defend yourself against violence or against harm. Um, that's been in the news recently with the, the, the death of a, a young man down in, I believe, in Florida. Uh, and the question was, is that a just use of defense in that situation? We'll let the courts decide that. But if you are being attacked, you have a right to defend yourself. A country has a right to defend itself against attack. That's why we have armies to defend our country. There is a just uh, cause to defend yourself against violence. That is positively defending or uh, obeying this command not to commit murder. The Lord Jesus is the one who gives us the example of uh, enhancing the life of others. After all, he gave himself for us that we might live eternally. Uh, through His grace. And so Jesus shows us how we ought to love one another and not be uh, guided by hatred or animosity. Sacrifice ourselves for the benefit of others uh, so that their lives might be enhanced. Our scripture reading this morning will be given to us by Mr. Scott Polish. This morning's reading is found in the book of Micah, chapter 3, all of chapter 3, and it begins on page 920. Then I said, listen you leaders of Jacob, rulers of the house of Israel, should you not know justice, you who hate good and love evil, who tear the skin from my people and the flesh from their bones, weep my people's flesh, strip off their skin, and break their bones in pieces, who chop them up like meat for the pan, like flesh for the pot? 
Then they will cry out to the Lord, but he will not answer them. At that time he will hide his face from them, because of the evil they have done. This is what the Lord says. As for the prophets who lead my people astray, if one feeds them, they proclaim peace. If he does not, they prepare to wage war against him. Therefore, night will come over you without visions, and darkness without divination. The sun will set for the prophets, and the day will go dark for them. The seers will be ashamed, and the diviners disgraced. They will all cover their faces because there is no answer from God. But as for me, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, and with justice and might, to declare to Jacob his transgression, to Israel his sin. Hear this, you leaders of the house of Jacob, you rulers of the house of Israel, who despise justice and distort all that is right, who build Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with wickedness. For leaders judge for a bribe, for priests teach for a price, and her prophets sell fortunes for money. Yet they lean upon the Lord and say, Is not the Lord among us? No disaster will come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion will be plowed like a field. Jerusalem will become a heap of rubble, the temple hill a mound overgrown with thickets. Our next hymn, number 468, O God of Truth, whose living word holds with air and breath. Number 468, and we'll stand to sing. Some 
fascinating insights into the, the ways in which uh, major states communicate and, and uh, persuade populations, uh, also in the way that they affect populations to move their opinions along. Uh, it's a dramatic story. Uh, but one of the things that struck out in my mind was not so much all the information about the environmental science and uh, these kinds of things, although that was fascinating in and of itself, but a scene at the end of the, the story, towards the end of the story, where one of the actors or one of the characters in the story is named Ted Bradley, and he played the role of a uh, Hollywood actor who was caught up in the environmental movement and was all enthusiastic about supporting, providing for uh, the, uh, the spread of environmentalism. And Michael Crichton goes into the ideas or the concepts that lay behind this environmental movement, the, this uh, view of man and of nature. Is man and nature basically good to be trusted and to be enjoyed, or is, is mankind evil? And is the world filled, the, the environment filled with uh, the curse uh, that frustrates all that we do? Well, the Hollywood actor had all these positive views of the world around him, and in this one particular scene, uh, they are in a helicopter flying over a, a tropical island, and a helicopter takes a crash landing, but as they're looking over the island, uh, he's commenting on how pristine the beauty of this island is, and what a beautiful place it is to live in, and uh, how eager he was to meet the natives down on the, the island, and how gracious and kind they would be when he arrived. Well, they, they crash landed, and then uh, some of the others within that helicopter did not share his view of the natives. They warned that the people in this community have a reputation for being headhunters, maybe even cannibals. He said, oh, that can't be. That's just stories told by people who are just trying to make you fearful. Well, it turns out that they were right. And the actor, Ted Bradley, came to, shall we say, a delicious fate. <laughs> and it was a hard thing for me to read through this. It was the first time I'd ever seen such a thing. And you know, I'm reminded of that as I looked at what Micah has to say here in chapter 3. It's hard to read what he had to say, and I commend Scott for going through it. it, it it's hard to read what Micah has to say about the way that those who were in power treated their own population. Micah is a small town prophet who is arguing against the corruption that he sees in high places, in Jerusalem and the positions of authority and power there, whether it be the ruling class, those who are in the civil authority, or the religious class, the prophets and the priests. We saw last week that he also addressed those who were in the business realm, those who uh, made use of their... Uh, their position of influence and power to uh, advance themselves at the expense of the poor and even the middle class. And we saw last week that within Jewish society of that day, there was a great separation occurring where the rich got richer, the poor became more poor, and the middle class was being decimated. So Micah, coming from a small town, being a small town prophet, not trained especially like Isaiah in all the court and uh, uh, science there in Jerusalem, but Micah being a small town prophet nonetheless is bold enough to call the leaders of his community to account. He says, listen. He tries to get their attention. You need to think about what I have to say here. And I'd rather think that they would have heard what Micah had to say with the vigorous language that he makes use of when he characterizes the effects of their actions there in Jerusalem. He spoke how the, the wealthy, the landowners, the business owners, and so forth, who were engaged in corrupt business practices, what we might today call crony capitalism, uh, these corrupt business owners were impoverishing people, taking their properties, their homes, taking the clothing off their back, and leaving them uh, to fend for themselves. Now, Micah goes even sharper in his criticism with regard to the rulers. He says to them, you are the ones who are supposed to know justice. You are the ones who are trained in the law. 
You're the ones that ought to have a, a finer sense of what uh, justice demands. How do we have an ordered society? How are the needs of the poor taken care of? How are crimes to be punished? You of all people are set up and placed in a position to decide what is justice, what is just and right. And it's these very people who should be looked upon for justice. These are the ones who love that which is evil and hate that which is good. They are completely distorted or turned around in their system or ideas of justice. They rejected God's description of justice given in the covenant under Moses, the Ten Commandments as we've been developing them, and the case laws as they developed beyond that. They have abandoned God's law and set up their own laws, what they consider to be right, good, and just, which typically ends up enriching them or empowering them, sustaining them. So, Micah confronts the rulers of the day for their failure to uphold the standards of justice. Justice was perverted, it was twisted. We see that today in our own country, in our own culture, the way that just standards are hated and rejected and replaced with a more modern humanistic standard of righteousness or justice. And we're all called to follow along the main line, if you will, politically correct point of view. And so if you speak out against certain uh, sins in the world today, well, then you are not really uh, sophisticated. You're not well trained. Uh, in fact, you are backwards in your point of view, and you at least need to be educated. And so if you speak out against uh, immorality of a variety of fashions, if you speak out against socialism and the, 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 the forcible taking of property that goes on in that, the various ways in which God's law is abandoned, then what you find is a distortion of justice. Man's law replacing God's law. God says, thou shalt not commit adultery. And so, all of our family life comes under the rigors of God's law. But men tend to dis step aside from that and say, well, there are a variety of things that you can do. It's okay. It doesn't hurt as long as somebody isn't hurt. You can have same-sex relationships. That doesn't matter. You can have multiple relationships. That doesn't matter. As long as nobody is hurt. As long as there's consensual people are consensual in the relationship, then it's okay. That's man's law. Is that consistent with God's law? Property. God says, thou shalt not steal. There are property rights. Is our society advancing more and more towards a system where everyone is to share equally in everything? And eventually, what you have is going to be mine because I'm going to vote it to be mine. You see, Micah could speak as well against the kinds of things that occur, not just in our country, but in countries around the world. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. He calls upon them to think about what justice demands. What are the proper standards by which we govern a society? Are they standards which we devise by our scientific efforts? Or do we depend upon God and His Word to describe the basic principles out of which we develop life? Micah excoriated the, the rulers of his day and showed the effects of what they are doing. When they do not abide by God's standards, but impose their own standards, inevitably that corrupts everything. You see, later on in the chapter, he talks about how the rulers, the, the judges, judged when they received a bribe. Money came into the political process and began influencing decisions. Politics was influenced by money. I remember some years ago, there's a story of a Louisiana congressman, I believe, by the name of William Cold Cash Jefferson, who uh, was caught by the, an FBI sting. Uh, accepting bribes or cash payments uh, so that, that he would uh, open up markets for different people in Africa. He had various connections and influence there and he used the money that he 
I received to open up these markets to other folks. Well, uh, he was caught by a video camera as they taped him taking the, a, a, a briefcase full of money. And when the FBI followed up and came to his office, they opened up a freezer in his office and found $90,000 uh, of cold cash <laughs> in his freezer. Money affects politics. It affects the way people make decisions. And uh, Micah convicted the leaders of his day for the influence that money had on their decisions. It has a horrible effect on the people of God. He has this vision of, of these wealthy rulers taking their own people and really acting in a cannibalistic way towards their own people. Michael, Michael uses vigorous, offensive language to speak of the effects of these kinds of things where the rulers are tearing the flesh and eating and putting things in a pot and stirring it up. It's horrible stuff. It's an image that's no doubt going to get your attention. But Micah has a point behind it. Your corrupt practices are doing great harm to the people of God. Bad decisions and, and places of power and authority wreak havoc upon people. And you need to be sensitive to that. Micah says that God himself is sensitive to these things. He's not a, 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 an observer of the human situation, just simply sitting back and watching these things going on. Micah sees the Lord as one being offended and upset by what is occurring. And the Lord shows the, the rulers of his day what justice really is. This one-for-one -one correspondence. Remember in the law of Moses, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. This is the standard of justice. You take something from me, then you must restore it. And sometimes you have to pay a penalty for the act of taking that thing from me. There was a, a, a sense of justice in the old covenant law. And God does that with regard to these rulers. So you have no compassion on the weak and the poor. You devour their property. You devour their lives. And you pay no attention to the cries and the screams for help or mercy. Well, I'm going to bring an army upon you. And they will devastate the city of Jerusalem. They will depopulate it. They will make it into a mound of rubble. And when you cry out to me, sorry, I can't hear you. What a horrible judgment God pronounces upon these rulers. That in the moment when they feel their need, and in their piety, they cry out to God, not because they've repented of their sins, but because they need help. God says, I will not hear you. I won't hear you. There can be no fright, more frightening moment in an individual's life than to be given over by God to judgment. The writer to the Hebrews puts it again in very uh, powerful words. When he says it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. There's no more frightening thing than to be given over finally to your sin. And that's why it is so important that we repent of sin now here in this life. Turning from it and seeking mercy from God now while this is a day of salvation. But Micah does not only address the rulers of the day, those who are in positions of government authority, he also speaks of the, those who are in religious positions of authority. The prophets and priests. Uh, you might look today at pastors and teachers in the churches, theologians and so forth, other religious leaders, imams, uh, priests and what have you. And here, Micah examines their conduct and shows how they too have fallen short. The priests of the day, or the prophets of the day, prophesy only so long as they are being fed. You take care of them, then they're your best friend. They speak of God's peace on you. They explain away all of your misfortunes and your sins. They say, God loves you. He will help you. He will bless you. He will prosper you. 
everything will go well for you. But <laughs> you stop putting something into the into the tithes and the offerings, you don't contribute or support them, you don't help them out, then all of a sudden it's a war on you from the pulpit. Like the war on poverty, the war on women, all that, all this kind of stuff. It's a war on those who don't feed the prophets. And Micah goes after these fellows for their wickedness. Their only concern is, again, to enrich themselves. And so if they go where the money's at. And they don't speak out against the injustice that's occurring in their community or their society, lest they offend those in power and those who are supporting them and flooding their uh, offering place with cash. The prophets of the day should have been those who called upon the, the rulers to repent. They should have corrected them. But they held back. They kept quiet. They didn't say anything. Because it might offend them. There's a great danger that money will corrupt not only those who are in politics, but also those who are in the pulpit. Those whose interest only is the kinds of support that they will have. And so you have pastors who go to churches without regard to the truths of God's Word, but simply because there's a good salary there. There's a comfortable living there. It's a beautiful church with wonderful stone architecture and so forth, and beautiful wood floors and stained glass windows. I would have loved to have been in a church like that. But sometimes you've got to sacrifice the truth to get there. Not always. Some folks will not speak out against sin. They will not explain the sin of God's people from the pulpit. That's a real problem. Micah contrasts these false prophets whose only purpose is to enrich and feed themselves with himself. He stands before his congregation who, who, as one who is filled with the Spirit of the Lord, who is empowered to uphold the standards of justice, to proclaim righteousness to the congregation. Micah stood opposed to the wickedness of his day, and he was willing to stand up and speak that which was right. Part of the ministry of the Spirit of God is to convict people of their sins. Like that novel by Michael Crichton and the debate that he had about whether human nature is basically good or evil. The answer of the Spirit in the Scriptures is plain. The nature of the human heart is basically evil, corrupt. It's hostile to God and His ways. It has a different standard of righteousness than what God provides for. It has a different goal in life, not pleasing God, but pleasing self or advancing one's self. The heart of man is basically corrupt and evil. And it's the work of the Spirit to show that. To expose human sin. Jesus speaks of the ministry of the Spirit in John's Gospel, the 16th chapter. He says that the Spirit is coming into the world to, to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and the judgment to come. That's the work of the Spirit. To show us our sins. To remind us that all of the kinds of things that we do that we don't are not too proud or happy about, those are offenses are not just offenses against others that perhaps... That, after a little while are forgotten, there are offenses against God Himself, who sees everything. There are offenses against others as well. And the Spirit takes these things and applies them to our hearts for a good purpose. That we would see the evil in our hearts and repent and cry out to God for mercy, for cleansing, for forgiveness. After all, here, Micah, as he very powerfully addresses the evil of his day and speaks against those who are corrupt in their practices, does so for good purposes. He speaks by the power of the Spirit of Christ. It's Christ himself, the Lord, who is examining the culture of his day. 
Isaiah, the prophet who also spoke in Jerusalem of the day, said in the 61st, 61st chapter of his prophecy that the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's uh, enabled me to proclaim the gospel, to proclaim release to the prisoner and set free those who are, are held captive. This is a prophecy of the coming of Christ. It is his work and his ministry to proclaim the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus takes up that promise in Luke's Gospel, in the fourth chapter, at the very start of his ministry, where he says, these things are fulfilled in me in this very day. He is the one on whom the Spirit rests. And he is the one who examines the human heart. He sees us fully and completely. And he speaks out, proclaiming life and salvation to those who repent the wrath of God to those who continue in their sins. Well, Micah proclaimed a word of justice to the people of his day. And the Christian ministry today must also take up the standards of God's righteousness and hold people accountable, not just simply those of us here within the congregation, but those out in the community at large. Those in positions of authority and power need to be confronted with the Word of God. What does God require of you as you serve as president, as judge, as congressman or senator? What does God require of you today? What are just standards? What does God require of you if you're a minister, an elder, a teacher in a church, a theologian at a seminary? How does God require you to proclaim righteousness and justice in the world today. Micah recognizes that the only way in which we can do these things is by the power of the Spirit of Christ dwelling upon us. It's by that renewing power that we are enabled to proclaim Christ. And so as you consider what Micah has to say, consider the world that we live in today and what God might say to different positions of those who are in authority, you need the help of the Spirit to do that. We need the power of the Spirit to convince, to convict, to lead to salvation and faith and life. Micah points us to Jesus Christ who provides us with that Spirit. He is the one who by his ascension into heaven poured out the Spirit upon the church and empowers you today to be like Micah of old, proclaiming justice, both to those with whom you are acquainted, but also to those who are in positions of authority and power. We all stand before God in his ways. And so seek the power of the Spirit. Be guided by his word. Proclaim Christ as the one before whom all must give account. And glorify the Lord who brings us salvation through faith in Him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Micah and for his boldness in his day, a small town prophet of no remarkable background, but nonetheless one who was willing to stand up in his day and proclaim the need for justice in all areas of society. We thank you for his boldness. Uh, we see in that the boldness that comes by those who are filled with your spirit. We pray that you would grant us that we too would be bold by your spirit to proclaim justice, to proclaim righteousness, so that all may repent of sin and turn to Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the righteousness that he provides us, where he clothes us with that perfect righteousness, such that we can stand before you dressed in his perfect righteousness and be declared innocent. Uh, just before you. We pray for your blessing on us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's respond to the ministry of God's Word by bringing before the Lord our morning tithes and offerings.
respond to the mercies of God by standing before Him and singing His praise. Stand and sing. Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, 
We thank you that by his death, he's paid the full penalty for all of our sins. And his perfect righteous life uh, stands before you for us. And by him we are saved. By him we are justified. We thank you that by him we are acquitted in your great heavenly court. We pray, O oh God, that through Christ, your spirit would strengthen us to live for you, to live by faith, to live a life of love, to live in hope uh, with each day, looking up above to Christ who is enthroned in glory. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would strengthen us, that we might live before you in the world today, bringing all of life under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we pray for our church. We pray for the ministry of your word here, that it would be faithful and true to the scriptures, that it would be faithful in proclaiming Christ and his work. We pray, O oh Lord, that both in the pulpit and in the Sunday school and in our Bible studies and in private conversations, your word would be faithfully proclaimed, that Christ would be exalted and that we would be strengthened by grace through faith. We pray, Lord, for your blessing upon uh, our congregation, that we would grow in our understanding of your ways and love you and serve you by the power of your spirit. We pray that you would minister to those who are in need. We think of our elderly. We pray that you would uphold uh, the rest of us who also feel the weakness of the body and feel uh, overcome from time to time by uh, its uh, aches and pains. We pray for your hand of uh, care and blessing on each of us, that you would defend us and protect us from harm. We thank you for our medical community and the way that they provide for us. We pray for your blessing on them. We pray for your blessing on our doctors, our hospital. Uh, and those who are in our uh, nursing homes, we pray that you would strengthen them for their work and, and watch over them. Father, we thank you for our police officers and those who serve our local community in protecting us against fires. We pray for your blessing and provision for them and their needs. We pray that you would defend them and help them to do that which is right and just, keep them from harm and from evil. Father, we pray that your blessing would be on uh, the witness of our church, uh, in foreign missions, we thank you for those who serve in distant places. Father, we pray for our mission in Uganda. We thank you for those that you have placed. We pray for uh, your blessing on these, that your spirit would uphold them in their work. We pray, Lord, that you would advance your kingdom in uh, Uganda and throughout all of Africa. We thank you for their uh, uh, service. Father, we thank you for our president, for his administration, for our Congress, for our Supreme Court, and the many decisions that they must make. We pray that you would guide them all in the paths of righteousness and justice, deliver us from wickedness and evil, from corruption, guard them from the evil influence of money. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would help them to make just and good decisions that would promote the peace and prosperity of your people. We ask that you would defend us from our enemies, uh, protect those who serve in our military, and pray for your protection of them. We thank you for your mercies to us and we would ask that you would teach us to pray even as our Lord taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Fear not, O little flock. Number 478, and we'll stand to sing.
Make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace.